Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, really happy to be here in this beautiful city uh, in this great event. Uh, thank you very much for Lion and Intertrust. Great team. Uh, and I really like the concept itself of the 360 holistic uh, uh, perspective that uh, goes beyond technical data uh, and technology and management. So here I am, and I will uh, talk to you about what used to be called television, uh, video media. But it's really much more than that. Uh, and I think there are m few <coughs> questions that have a larger long-term implication than the way we shape our communication system. Uh, because if the medium is really the message, then these messages influence people and institutions. Then tomorrow's uh, media and today's media policy will govern future society and economy. And so this is what I'm going to talk to you about. So uh, let me start by saying that we are on the verge of one of humanity's greatest leaps in media communications, maybe the greatest, and consequently, also one of the major disruptions of social, cultural, political, and economic arrangements. So television has come a long way, and I would like to differentiate between three different uh, stages of television. So the first one I'd call the, is the uh, first generation television, basically broadcasting over the air, uh, three, five channels, whatever, government controlled and owned in many countries, uh, corporate in America. Uh, <clears throat> it ushered in mass audience, mass marketing, all kinds of stuff. The content was middle of the road, middle politically, middle brow, middle everything. <clears throat> now, Themes here that we have is openness and access versus privacy and security. So what about openness and access in that first generation of TV? Well, basically, there was no openness. It was totally controlled by the people who had the license, whether they were state-owned or commercial, and a few commercials. So uh, you couldn't really do anything, you couldn't get in, you couldn't do it. It was not an open system. In fact, the whole concept of openness would have been met by total uh, disbelief and misunderstanding. But in terms of access to the content, it was free in a sense of it didn't cost anything in, most, in many countries, although there was some user fee in some countries. It didn't cost anything, and it was uh, uh, available everywhere, so it was free and available, and so it was free financially to the user, but totally unfree when it came to content. Now, what about privacy and security in that environment of first generation of TV? They were also non-issues. There was no privacy issue because other than nosy neighbors, nobody knew what you were watching. It was a one-way broadcast medium. Um, and uh, security, there were virtually no issues. There was jamming by governments and sometimes by uh, uh, people who were kind of blundering into the uh, space there. But on the whole, nothing happened. There were occasional incidents. For example, one well-known one was uh, the hack of Max Headroom uh, in Chicago, a TV station that ran him for several minutes. Nobody still knows who that was. That was all on on uh, analog broadcasting. When television became, in the 1990s, digital, things somewhat changed. And so we had in France a, uh, uh, the uh, state-owned uh, TV5 um, uh, network that has stations and has websites and all kinds of cable, cable sites. That was hacked by ISIS. And so here we have the cyber caliphate, Je suis uh, ISIS. Uh, and that kind of went on for a while until they could shut it down. So that was first generation TV. The second generation of TV, basically cable and satellite, multi-channel, uh, first analog, later uh, digital. Uh, and that changed the content into multiple small specialized channel, the golf channel, uh, say, or the recipe TV, uh, or something called Bridges, uh, which was dedicated to the proposition of multicultural understanding. 
Unfortunately, the channel was closed down when its CEO uh, was convicted for beheading his ex-wife. Uh, so, so I'm not making this up. Um, so so uh, uh, cable television, however, uh, had several privacy and security problems. So the first one was the, uh, let's say, the, the access issue, uh, were the unauthorized access to content. That was already an issue for analog. It became even more of an issue for digital. Uh, and so now there are, if you go to YouTube, numerous people who will explain to you how you can get channels for free, HBO for free, this for free, that for free. All you need is a paper clip. And look, it is so easy that uh, anybody can do it, apparently. All right. Uh, so so uh, the, second, the second digital type uh, issue is the unauthorized access to distribution. OK, so distribution, uh, and that, that kind of went through in China. There was an instance in which anti-government hackers hijacked uh, cable television system and broadcast pro-democracy messages. And so remember uh, the uh, June, June the 4th, which is the anniversary of Tiananmen uh, protests. And they said, one party authoritarian rule always ends in disaster. And they said several other things. Uh, the local government issued a statement that lawbreakers had released malicious information and added, Please make a distinction, citizens, between right and wrong, and do not spread these pictures or statements. And um, if you kind of go on various search engines, that kind of you could not find anything, any reference to all this. Um, there were other instances uh, in which cable TV networks were um, hacked. Uh, but I think the most interesting part, actually, is the uh, disruption of the internet via, through cable. Normally we think of disruptions as the you use the digital, the internet system in order to disrupt a non-digital, physical, or other system. But here's the, exactly the opposite. Because you can go through the uh, connected TV, you can use an outside signal in order to get into the internet and there's no IP address, you cannot be traced. There's all kinds of neat ways in which kind of havoc uh, can be can be done. So this is, uh, and there have been instances in which this was done. At my own university, Columbia, a recent paper about a year ago uh, presented uh, from the ether to the ethernet attacking the internet using broadcast digital television and explained that, uh, that you could actually, with equipment worth $450, could uh, basically bring down entire systems. Uh, profitably, uh, and it's kind of actually remarkable that not more of this has actually happened so far. But now, this is kind of in some ways my way of getting into the, from the here and now to the next generation, the third generation of television, which is, of course, around already, video over the internet, online TV, over the top TV, video, there are various descriptions, various names for it, and that does a number of things. One of them is uh, simply to widen the media, that is to do more of the same, another distribution form, uh, wherever you want it, whenever you want it. And so that's basically conceptually is just kind of doing much, much more at different times. But it's still linear TV, just more of it. Uh, more interesting in a way, in many ways, is the uh, deepening of the media, uh, where the greater richness and ability to transmit signals and bits enables us to do more different new things affordably, economically, uh, over the, uh, over, uh, for video. And that has been actually happening. And so, and since we have the rate of the uh, uh, Moore's Law as a way of kind of describing um, bumper sticker style, the progress in technology. So here we have uh, Moore, here's the guy on the left. Um, and, uh, and the speed trends indeed of transmission 
affordable transmission have been progressing roughly for 100 years that way. It's a linear type uh, depiction. So a, a increase of approximately 40% of performance almost per year, which is extraordinary. Now, so everything is moving at a rate of 40% or they're about progressing consumer electronics and all kinds of other stuff, uh, information technology, everything, right? Well, wrong, because television has not, for decades, not kept up with that particular growth rate. It has been, was a tightly controlled, standardized, ITU controlled and other groups, broadcasting groups, controlled type progress that moved uh, by what I call the uh, Sarnoff rate after the, in a way, the godfather of commercial, early commercial television for decades, NBC and the United States RCA. And that, by my calculation, progressed at a rate, progress rate of 4% a year. And so it is that gap between the IT change, call it Moore's Law, and the television progress rate, call it Sarnoff's rate, uh, that is the gap, and that gap has been increasing. Well, it's been increasing for a long time, but not much longer, and already not anymore, because television, what we call television, is now becoming part of the more general digital uh, progress revolution. And so one of the most interesting things I think that is happening is that television is moving from that one-size-fits-all standardized solution controlled by a few privileged license holders uh, to one in which technology solutions will uh, uh, bound in the same way that they do in other parts of the IT system. And that will change the medium in a very radical way because things will move much faster and much less systematically uh, than they had before. Now, uh, many of you will remember uh, Marshall McLuhan, Canadian media sage, who said, among other things, the medium is the message, a famous aphorism, uh, meaning the content, uh, the, 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 uh, the distribution mechanism, the technical mechanism, the medium, is the message defines the content. And so as we progress, uh, at this kind of much faster rate technologically in that medium. Uh, therefore, the message, the content, the content styles, the genres will also change much more rapidly. And to the extent that we believe, and I do, that medium, also the medium messages affect how people think, politics, society more generally, saying it doesn't determine it, but it certainly affects it. Therefore, I think that we can say that the technological acceleration that is upon us now in the video field will also lead to a cultural acceleration uh, of various, various kinds. And we have already observed this in some of the instances of the cultural wars are affected, uh, kind of are driven by what is happening, that societies have a harder time uh, dealing socially and politically with change than they have technologically. And so what then is next in this third generation television beyond more uh, whenever you want it? Well, the kind of the easiest one, of course, are the larger screens, the flatter screens, the uh, uh, better, and then the 3D. Uh, and we all know that, and some of this has been more successful than others. More interesting in my mind is not so much the display per se, but elements that hadn't been there before when it comes to TV, such as interactivity coming from video games involving the viewer, the user, in an active way. Uh, the computer-generated avatars say that will place, can permit the placement of the individual user himself, herself, into the action. The immersiveness of, virtu of virtual reality uh, that has kind of now taken off from early beginnings, which were, hmm, were <laughs> early beginnings, which were perhaps a little kind of less consumer friendly, uh, to 
to, to the current, current uh, technology. Uh, but even that is kind of still clunky, and we will, 10 years or whatever, we'll laugh about it just as much as the one before, because after all, we're kind of like totally close to the world. More likely something like that. Well, it didn't work for Google, but that doesn't mean that the approach augmented and otherwise uh, is wrong. Uh, then we have cameras, increasingly or camera arrays that can kind of give us 360. We have uh, the ability now to project on multiple platforms uh, the same kind of video content, so it's not just TV watched on the TV. Uh, the transmission technology in turn kind of makes it, because it is much less distance uh, sensitive, means that television can move from national or even regional to national to international and global distribution. Um, then the production technologies of animation and rendering uh, that lead to uh, computer generated images uh, of various kinds. So here you see this is old. Uh, Russell Crowe fighting the tigers and the gladiators and the Romans. And the only thing that is actually genuine here is Russell Crowe's head. Uh, everything else is computer generated or computer modified. Um, and, and now that technology is actually also moving to, just in the process of gamification, to real time rendering so that actually quality can be created as you participate in it. You don't have to pre produce it. Uh, and now, and then there is uh, something recent the. Uh, real-time rendering uh, with facial recognition so that the computer can actually see you're smiling, you're frowning, you're doing something, and translate this in real time to uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, images of, of sorts. And so this generates television as a entertainment of immersion, uh, user immersion, user participation, and some user control. And in the process, what we now call video is changing. It is changing from the narrative a story, like a novel that you just kind of put, like a film that you put in, into uh, pictures, to an experience. Um, and the experience is that you're in it and you're participating in it. And you see experiential type economics happening in a lot of places, hotels and resorts and cruises and all kinds of make this much more of an experiential. And so you can imagine a future video that is uh, where you put stand there in, let's say, a film such as that, and you stand there in the water and you hear it and you feel it and you smell it even possibly, and you participate in the chant, or you're marching up and down the coast of Greece or more likely, you're going to be strapping on your car and take it for a test uh, drive, or you're going to participate in a basketball game and you're kind of going up and down the field with these real players, or you kind of swing a baseball bat, or you kind of uh, experience things uh, as never before without kind of leaving the comfort of your home. Uh, and you go up in up in Mount Everest, and you can participate there in the expedition. You pay maybe fifteen dollars for the experience, and you never have to put down your can of beer. Um, or you go on Mars again, convenience. Or you go into the adventure park, and again without standing in line, but you have the thrills, which after all, in the amusement parks are also artificial. So why not go all the way? Uh, or you go into gambling uh, and gamble and get the thrill of gambling and the money and the kind of ambiance in various ways. And where there's gambling, you also have, of course, adult content. And I've been trying to clean up my act here considerably. Uh, but basically, uh, there's always been that element in new media, in new media consumption. And there's no reason to assume that it's not going to happen uh, here, too. And so. That kind of television, video, TV, uh, what are its openness and access issues, and what are its security and privacy issues? Well, the openness part 
is actually very good because you now can participate. YouTube is an example, and YouTube you know, starts a bit with, let's say, cat videos, but it, it is now with something where people, serious filmmakers, independent filmmakers and others, are able to show stuff that has never been kind of shown before, and some of it is kind of frankly somewhat, somewhat crazy, you know, kind of like people, in order to garner audiences, go, huh, uh, no pun intended, out on a limb um, to just, just to, to get people's attention. So, but other people do serious type video. And so the openness is actually remarkably there. Certainly relative to first and second generation TV, they were tightly controlled by some large organizations. Uh, access, access to content is also reasonably fine. Uh, obviously, there's some financial issues and there's some kind of transmission content. The, the ISPs will throttle things down if you overdo it, but there's some ways probably around that. Um, and, and mobile phones uh, exist increasingly in environments where maybe people were not otherwise connected to broadband, but everybody has a cell phone around the world, and if they don't have it now, they will have it in five, 10 years. And so, so the world is on the verge of everybody connected in some fashion to something like internet uh, and to each other for the first time in human history. Okay, but what about the privacy? And so, so these are good, good things that I'm observing, openness and access. Uh, but what about the privacy and security in that third uh, generation of TV? Well, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, well, let's kind of start with the privacy, privacy part. Of course, uh, we do have, a, hmm, sorry, sorry, okay. Uh, what about the privacy, privacy part? As people participate in a two-way connected, immersive type, participatory, interactive way of video, they generate tons of data all the time. The upstream has always been the data generation type, type way. The downstream is much less of that. The upstream has it. And we will generate tons of data which will make it possible for people who are on the receiving end of that data to do what they've always been done well, and more recently, the data mining, the connection, connect the kind of the implications of it. Um, now, there's some advertisements that are three-dimensional and immersive, and here are some examples. But in some ways, that's kind of the boring part of it. That's just using the same old technology to do something. That, now, the new technology to do something of the same old, same old uh, video ads with a, kind of a few twists. The more interesting part, actually, to me, is that through that immersive participatory, you actually get data on people uh, that are far beyond what we used to have in the past. In the past, we had some social demographic and information and some information about uh, how kind of people's preferences to certain products and needs for certain products, and that was kind of useful and good. But now, in their participation in action, we actually get to see much more about people's character, about their preferences, about their vindictiveness and their con connectedness and their mercifulness and their attitude, how nice they are, how hard they are. Uh, we see things kind of even literally what turns people on uh, because, because we observe these things and can observe these things and then can make it use of it in a direct way, in an immediate way, in a real-time way, in the marketing pitches that people will have towards you, which were kind of in, in, in the product placement, in the way in which the advertisement interacts with you in real time. All these things are not just more of the same. I think they are kind of qualitatively quite already at a next level of influencing you that could be uncharitably characterized as 
kind of brainwashing because it will also not be used only commercially, that might be the pioneering, but also by political campaigns, by governments trying to influence you in a variety of ways. So this is all upon us when it comes to privacy. And now, uh, when it comes to security, uh, there too is kind of, it's complicated and I would argue kind of two, two sided type situations, uh, which requires us to understand who these providers are of the platform of that next generation of video. And, and those are some of the companies. That is to say, these are the facilities, the server farms, the Googles, uh, the Apples, uh, Facebooks, uh, Microsoft, um, HP. Uh, this is a model in which you will notice that there are virtually no car parks and no people, apparently. I mean, this is just seems to be just a kind of a bunch of warehouses of high technology and nobody seems to be around. Uh, so, so, excuse me for just a minute before I get there. So, you have these large entities and these kind of, and relatively small number of entities because the fixed, the costs are so large and the marginal costs are so low that the economies of scale are enormous and that favors fairly high companies and an oligopolistic market share if you're lucky. Um, and so a relatively non-competitive environment uh, with kind of important players, big players. And the double-edged nature here is the following. On the one hand, if you get one of these facilities hack into them, you can affect hundreds of millions of people around the world. That's the bad news. Uh, the better news is that these are companies with high sophistication that know how to deal with threats because they have the people and the skills and the foresight and the experience to deal with that, right? Well, that's what Equifax said too. Um, and so, so you never know, stuff happens. Um, secondly, uh, though on the positive end, and two, uh, these large companies are able given their skills in security maintenance and so on, to make this actually a service and a differentiating factor towards customers that can in fact compete our securities better than their security. Um, so potentially that introduces a market system, potentially because as I said, oligopolistic markets are not terribly competitive. Uh, but potentially at least this introduces an element of competition in security and yes, even privacy protection. Uh, it also enables uh, companies to, these large companies to provide security solutions and privacy solutions that correspond to the different rules in different countries. Because after all, remember, Europeans are one way and Japanese maybe another way and Chinese and US and so on and so forth. And what's a content provider, applications provider to do? In many instances, they will go with the lowest denominator, the hardest rule, kind of, so it's a race to the bottom uh, because it's cheaper to do it just one way. But a large company can differentiate its product in, and, and aim it at the rules that are applicable to in various countries. And so now to uh, come towards a conclusion, um, hopefully, uh, just one second. Uh, I'd like to describe something that can be perhaps be called kind of an elasticity of privacy and security, PS, with respect to access and openness. What I've argued here is that in that, certainly in the third generation of video, uh, we have some trade-off. The more open you are and the more access you give people, the more you also enable people to come in and hack and do security issues and take data, not, or the companies will have data that they can use that are against the privacy interests that we also like to, to protect. And so if you, if you describe the, uh, this elasticity 
uh, the way that economists do, uh, slightly modified here, you will have, you will see this is the definition of elasticity. And now you get into the first generation of television. And in that first generation, the derivative, the impact of uh, access and openness, AO, on privacy and security was essentially zero. So the whole thing is zero. So therefore, there was no real trade-off because the two were just worlds apart. When you move to the second generation, oops, to the second generation, however, sorry, uh, you have still a small impact, but not a zero impact anymore. There is, as I described to you, some, some ability to influence and to collect data and in a variety of ways. Um, and so you have a smallish type impact. But when it comes to the third generation of video, you do have a large trade-off. Um, and so the elasticities of third generation are larger than of second generation is larger than the first generation. Um, and so, it, so, so that is, has some implications. Okay, the implications include, just to st start us, that for some countries that actually trying to restrict the openness and access of people to, uh, to, the co to content or to providing of content, and you can fill in the blank which countries you have in mind, the excuse that we're doing this only in order to protect people's privacy and to protect security of the system becomes a rationalization and an excuse in order to engage in restrictive behavior. We're not restricting openness, we're just protecting security. Um, second, in a way, in parallel, large media platform companies will do pretty much the same thing. They will say, well, our large market share is actually a way, it's not just because we want to dominate the market. No, we want to protect you, the users, from all these security and privacy risks. Um, thirdly, likely to happen will be that governments will impose on media platform companies the responsibility to protect and to police security and privacy on their platforms. Uh, and we can, we can continue. Uh, in this trade-off, to come to a conclusion here, uh, as this trade-off grows, it becomes a more politically charged issue. Uh, and here, we are likely to overshoot and undershoot and oscillate in an unstable way. When, as somebody mentioned this already earlier. When we have some calamity of some sort, some big hack um, that creates, uh, that makes the air traffic system, say, kind of go, go dark for 24 hours, there will be clearly calls for more security, more security, <laughs> similarly on privacy issues. Uh, when every congressman's uh, tax filings will be online, there will be no doubt kind of major kind of attempts to protect privacy and so on. At the same time, because these companies are being tasked to do that policing, uh, and in effect being asked to do the, um, the, the censoring, uh, there will be a backlash against that too. And you can see that in kind of like, a, where is that now? I've, Sorry, my, my, my slide is, is blank, but it's kind of like the people are rising against Google and against Facebook because they are censoring what we can do. And so we have these kind of waves going back and forth. I mean, net neutrality and anti-zero uh, um, uh, zero rate and zero pricing uh, are kind of on the one hand, and then there will be the pro-privacy and pro-security uh, on the other hand. And, regulations will zipping back and forth. So therefore, where are we going? Uh, it seems to me that this is important not to let governments kind of run this whole show, but it's also unavoidable that this will not be a libertarian situation. Technology is the key here. I mean, government's role has to be, for example, establish clear rules of liability or responsibility um, and, and property ownerships and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, because of the externalities involved. Technology is extremely important because it creates protective mechanisms and tools that make it possible for people, security, privacy, 
uh, to coexist and to reduce that trade-off of privacy and security with the open markets then kind of can arise based on the technology protections and the tools available to individuals and to companies and to a competitive environment, provided we have a competitive environment. And so this, I believe, is kind of where we're heading, and it has to be clear-sighted, and people have to think it through. It's better to do this a little bit ahead of time, uh, even though we don't quite know where we're going economically, technologically, and um, in terms of government uh, policy, even though we cannot predict the future. Uh, some of the basic stories we can um, get, get right and get right in time before it's too late, before things are already established and then a status quo becomes uh, entrenched and hard to change. So this is what I wanted to describe to you. Uh, it's the uh, come to the end, but for this next generation video, which will be extraordinarily important to us, uh, culturally and politically and economically, it's just the beginning and I thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, if you want to talk to me offline, online, I'm here.